All right, sounds good. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. We appreciate your attendance and all of your support for the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism. Uh, before tonight's event, I want to remind you to uh, please keep your microphones muted. And if you would like to ask a question, please do so by typing it in, in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Also, we are recording this evening's event so we can share this important conversation. I am Jay Berseth, the Development Director for the Center. I want to take a quick moment to let you know uh, what we've been up to and our reporting priorities for the near future. As we continue our examinations into the public health crises that have been uh, further exposed by the coronavirus, we also just launched our Color of Money series, which is an ongoing project that examines our state's stark racial disparities in wealth and income. We also have several other projects on the horizon, including a narrative podcast surrounding possible police and prosecutorial misconduct in the Fox Valley area, a continuation of our reporting on environmental issues, including water contamination crisis throughout the state, and additional ongoing in-depth reporting that follows our guiding principles, protect the vulnerable, expose wrongdoing, and explore solutions. We look forward to potentially being able to meet you in person in the near future, but until then, we are excited to have you here virtually for this exciting event that your generosity has made possible, so thank you. I'm pleased to introduce Professor Mike Wagner of the UW-Madison School of Journalism and Mass Communication. His research, teaching, and service are animated by the question, how well does democracy work? His current research focuses on the sharp political divisions in Wisconsin, as well as nationally, examining, examining how we got to where we are today politically. His experience is not just academic, he has also uh, previously served as a press secretary on a congressional campaign in 2000, and I believe most importantly, was a political reporter for the local CBS station in Peoria, Illinois, and on AM radio in Omaha, Omaha Nebraska. Also joining us are the directors of Can You Hear Us Now? Jim Kirke and Susan Peters of 12 Letter Films. Jim and Susan are not only talented filmmakers, as you have seen, but they are longtime supporters of Wisconsin Watch. They split their time between New York and Wisconsin, where Susan grew up. And prior to making this film, they produced their 2017 short documentary on which Wisconsin Watch collaborated called Los Lecheros about Wisconsin's immigrant dairy workers. If you liked this documentary and value this type of in-depth journalism, please visit their website at 12letterfilms.com. That's 12, all spelled out, letterfilms.com. And leading tonight's discussion is DJ Hall, co-founder and man managing editor of Wisconsin Watch. D has more than 40 years of experience as a reporter and editor and joined Wisconsin Watch in 2015 as the managing editor. Her byline could be seen during her 24 years as a reporter at the Wisconsin State Journal in Madison, where she focused on projects and investigations. And now, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Dee. Thanks a lot, uh, Jay, and thanks everybody for coming tonight. Um, I'm gonna pose a series of questions uh, raised by Can You Hear Us Now, uh, Jim and Susan's film, to our resident experts, Mike, Jim, and Susan. We'll leave time at the end for more questions. Um, Mike, at the end of the movie, it recounts the so-called extraordinary session after Democratic Governor uh, Tony Evers narrowly beat incumbent Republican uh, Governor Scott Walker in 2018, but before he took office. During that hastily called a uh, special session, Republican lawmakers stripped Evers and incoming Attorney General Josh Call of certain powers. The changes tipped the balance of power more heavily toward the Republican-run legislature and away from those offices. You've done some research around that extraordinary session. What can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, thanks uh, for the question and thanks for having me, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, uh, we did uh, at the Center for Communication and Civic Renewal a public opinion survey of uh, Wisconsin adults uh, asking them, among a bunch of other things, what they thought about the decisions made by the state legislature during the extraordinary session. 53% of Wisconsinites said um, that they uh, opposed it. Um, uh, kind of outright and another about 15 percent kind of somewhat against it um, and only about 20 percent were really in favor the rest landed kind of at that midpoint on a, on a five point scale of you know thinking it was a bad idea to thinking it was a good idea there was of course not surprisingly a partisan difference virtually all democrats thought it was a bad idea um, most independents about 65 percent thought it was a bad idea and about 30 percent of republicans thought it was a bad idea so it wasn't a, a typical issue where republicans are, are united on one side and democrats are united on the other this was um, Democrats, most independents, and about a third of Republicans thinking that the power grab uh, was not good for Wisconsin politics. And that kind of fits a broader pattern of preferences for fair play in politics that Wisconsinites seem to have. They have those ideas about redistricting. They have those ideas about how votes should be counted. Uh, they have those ideas about um, the voice the minority party should have uh, in government. Uh, and it's, so it's not surprising to see that the, the breakdown on this really contentious issue wasn't purely partisan, even though our state has become much more polarized in the last 11 years. Well, that leads right into my next question is the past two presidential elections, uh, we've had such a narrow split decided by less than 25,000 votes, two different president, two sequential presidential elections, uh, first favoring Trump and then Biden. So why are we so split? Part of it's just demography, right? Part of it is just um, the state has a couple of population centers that are overwhelmingly Democratic and lots of uh, other parts of the state that are, are more Republican. So part of it is just kind of regional divides or divides between urban areas, suburbs, uh, small micropolitan areas and, and rural areas. Part of it is the differences in what people in these different parts of the state want. And part of it, I think, is differences in the perceptions of people uh, throughout the state when it comes to what they think they're getting relative to what they think other people are getting. And so my friend and colleague who, who works with us, uh, Kathy Kramer in Political Science, chronicled some of this in her great book, The Polit Politics of Resentment, right? One reason we're so divided is that Republican lawmakers in, in our state are, are good at fomenting resentment for what uh, benefits come to Madison and Milwaukee. And part of the argument goes that uh, Madison are a bunch of uh, professorial liberal elites and Milwaukee is uh, an urban center, uh, which both get different kinds of government benefits that they don't deserve. And that's a reason that uh, people living in other parts of the state ought to oppose uh, what it is folks in those areas overwhelmingly democratic areas want. And then on the other side, you have folks in those larger cities seeing that more tax dollars per capita go to rural areas than go to urban areas and you have them uh kind of objecting to uh the kind of rejecting to the the governing style uh that's taken place in our state uh since governor walker uh, was first elected and, and passed act 10 uh in in the state legislature where um we so that's really where contentious politics took off and at that point we really saw a shift in our state where people literally stopped talking to friends. 33% of Wisconsinites said they stopped talking to a friend because of their opinion about Act 10. When we asked the question again in 2018, that number had grown to 50%. When we asked it in 2020, it had grown to 55%. And so people have literally cut people out of their lives in our state due to different political views, which is just not how things were um, prior to 2010. And um, you may have already answered this, but based on your research, what do Republicans in Wisconsin want? What so what they don't want they don't want liberals, and they don't want Milwaukee and Madison getting all the money. Uh, is there a 
discrete set of things that they actually do want. Yeah, it, it's a little different than what Democrats want. Re Republicans in we, so we've asked, uh, we've done surveys in 2018, 19 and 2020 and asked a lot of the same questions over time, both about issue priorities, but also about more identity and cultural priorities. And Republicans uh, overwhelmingly want to feel respected. They want to feel as though uh, they are doing hard work and should benefit from that work. Um, on a policy side, they prefer police to get the benefit of the doubt uh, in cases where uh, police make decisions that are contested by others. Uh, they prefer lower taxes, although uh, notably, um, even Republicans tend to favor increasing taxes on the top 5% of income earners. We even asked if people would be okay with a 70% marginal tax rate for those earning more than $10 million, and a plurality of Republicans supported that as well. Well, so they want low taxes in general, but, but not for the super wealthy. Um, they also do want liberal tiers, right? There are There is a set of Republicans who strongly prefer that Democrats not get what they want. And that seems to be a, a priority for some Republicans in our state in a way that it's not a priority for Democrats in, the same, in, our, in our same state. So well, maybe a uh, Democrat should pretend to want something that they, or not want something that they do want. Anyway, the my <laughs> next question is, same for the Democrats. What do they want? What are their core values based on your research? Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know if the, if the Democrat should act like my sister and pretend uh, when I was growing up that she wanted something I didn't want so that I would let her have it. Uh, but um, so Democrats in our, in our research suggest uh, that they want more government resources spent on education, transportation, um, uh, and healthcare. They uh, prefer access to legal abortion. They prefer legal marijuana. Um, they uh, also prefer expanded access to voting rights. So they're uh, way more likely than Republicans in our state to support the idea of early voting, um, to say they actually have engaged in early voting, to support the idea of voting by mail, to say they actually have engaged in voting by mail. And so they also uh, prefer greater expansion to the franchise. And so those are some of the policy priorities we've seen over and over again. Areas of agreement between the parties we've seen largely on immigration reform. Uh, the parties both seem fairly normally distributed um, and kind of have moderate views uh, about immigration reform um, in, in the state. Um, and also uh, both seem to favor some police reform, but certainly differ about how much and for whom. And, and when you say the parties, you mean people belonging to the different parties. The parties Correct. Yeah. seem to not always represent the people who claim to belong to them either. That's right. When I say the parties, I mean the individual adults in Wisconsin who, I, who say they identify with one of the two major parties. It's, yeah, it's certainly not the case that um, uh, voters in Wisconsin are, are getting represented in terms of their majority preferences uh, by the legislature. Uh, that's a that's a follow-up question later. So what do you see as the future for Democrats and Republicans in Wisconsin? Do you see the state shifting one direction or another, or do, do we seem to be kind of locked in this um, sort of very split situation? I think we, I, I, my guess is that we are locked in a pretty pretty equilibrium tension between Republicans and, and, and Democrats. And so um, it, it's, it's becoming the case that Democrats you know, need to focus more and more on voter turnout in Madison and Milwaukee, almost to the point where that alone uh, can make them extremely competitive, if not eking out statewide elections, whereas Republicans have more shoring up to do um, in other parts of the state. And, and the area that I would say we would want to watch, like the, the area that seemed to matter in 2020, when we look at how the state flipped from supporting uh, former President Trump in 2016 to supporting now President Biden uh, in the 2020 election, are uh, suburbs that had been strongly in favor uh, of Donald Trump and some stayed in favor of Trump, but less strong. Uh, and others, um, other suburban areas flipped a bit uh, to Joe Biden. And some of that we can actually tie back in some ways to that very first question about the, the power uh, grab done in the lame duck session after the 2018 race. The Republicans who did not like that decision were suburban Republicans. And they're the same people uh, generally who uh, were less likely to vote for Donald Trump, even though they were Republicans or independent leaning Republicans uh, in 2020. So one of the questions that the film posed was how Wisconsin went from being a fountain of progressive ideas to a proving ground for conservative policies, including curbs on collective bargaining, voter ID, and policies like that. What's your explanation for how this change came about? Well, I think part of it is, I think it's important to realize that while Wisconsin has been this 
you know, uh, a, you know, as you point out, a fountain of progressive ideas. It also, you know, was, uh, you know, the home state of Joe McCarthy, right? We've always had a tension between very liberal uh, preferences and very conservative preferences, both sometimes finding ways to win statewide elections. Um, we'd been more to the left, I think, uh, clearly uh, in the state's history. I think that the film was quite right uh, to point that out um, and to ask this really interesting question of how this happened. And I think a few different things that we can point to in our, in our research suggests what's happened. One um, relates to the long, slow decline of the local newspaper as more and more local newspapers either become weeklies or online only or maybe publish a couple times a week or outright close down we see a greater polarization uh, in voting in those communities um, we see the rise of conservative talk radio in wisconsin you can hear more than 80 hours a day uh, in a 24-hour day there are 80 hours of conservative talk if you kind of loop together all the different media markets where radio talk exists in the state and so there's a, a very strong um, political bent to some talk radio that's coming from one side and liberal talk radio has just never been popular and the liberal uh, liberals on the radio just don't have um, a, a, a popular counterpoint um, uh, to, to kind of rival conservative talk. And so we've seen these media responses. So less local news coverage tends to mean that people look somewhere else. They might look to talk radio, they might look to cable news. Cable news, of course, is famously less middle of the road uh, than local newspapers tend to be. Um, and we've also seen I think greater um, intent from outside groups to try to influence the kinds of people who run for office and then the kinds of laws they pass once they're there. And we've seen this with uh, folks like the Koch brothers and the McIver Institute um, in terms of both ideas and funding to help uh, kind of push ideas such as Act 10, um, to push uh, right to work, uh, to push um, less regulation um, and, and those sorts of things. And so we see more kind of outside groups that will write kind of a, a dummy bill that they can then have different majority state legislatures that, that um, would support it around the country uh, introduce in one way or another. And, and we've seen Wisconsin be a state that's done a lot of those those early kinds uh, of, of kind of bellwethers, those early kind of test balloons of, of some of the more um, conservative uh, bills that um, were passed uh, during Governor Walker's uh, time uh, as, as governor of, of Wisconsin. And so I think it's kind of a confluence of different changes in the news media and different energy resources and legislative help coming from outside uh, of the traditional uh, halls of lawmaking. So um, as the film pointed out, and as we, the irrelevant Sheila Plotkin so aptly illustrates, the Wisconsin legislature is not very responsive to constituent feedback on certain issues. Why is that? And is there anything that could change that? I think one reason is that most Wisconsin lawmakers are safe, which is to say they, they live uh, and work uh, in heavily uh, gerrymandered districts that make it hard for uh, incumbents to lose. Um, well, that's one thing we found in uh, research we did um, about our state is first, if you take the percentage of votes cast for one political party and say, if the Republicans get 53% of the votes, we might expect them to get 53% of the legislative seats. That would be kind of a, a perfect match of the number of votes to the number of seats a party gets. And that's just not what happens in our state. Um, Republicans get between 40 and 45, usually a uh, percent of the votes, and they get between 50 and 60% uh, of the seats. And so the way that the districts are, are drawn extraordinarily advantage uh, the Republicans over the Democrats. But the Democrats who win are also generally in pretty safe districts. And so Republicans living in those districts who want to complain to Democrats are less likely to find a sympathetic ear, just as Democrats living in districts represented by Republicans are, are less likely to find a sympathetic ear. And so part of it is that lawmakers don't need to be responsive to the whole district. They need to be responsive to the activist partisans in their district, the ones who are giving them money, the ones who are knocking on doors, uh, the ones who are voting in primary elections. And those are the people who are, who are getting the most responsiveness uh, on average uh, from, from lawmakers. And if there was one thing you could change about Wisconsin and its politics, what would that be? Whew. I would, I'm gonna cheat and say two things. One would be to enforce 
um, a, a non to have to have redistricting done by a nonpartisan committee, which is what uh, a majority of Wisconsinites prefer. Uh, only 13% of Wisconsinites told us in our, in our surveys that they prefer the current system where the legislature is kind of in charge. Uh, they, people prefer a nonpartisan redistricting commission. And I think that would make a, a great help. But I think the other thing, if I could really, like that's a policy change that, you know, actually could maybe someday happen. The other thing that I would really want to do if I could wave a magic wand would be to force lawmakers to actually engage in conversation and debate with each other rather than gaveling in and gaveling out of special sessions that the governor uh, is, is asking for or rather than um, getting up and leaving when lawmakers from the other side uh, speak uh, in, in the legislature or or, or, not, or get on their phones and not pay attention um, when, when folks on the other side uh, are talking or dismissing out of hand um, the uh, what's really behind uh, a, a proposal from one side or the other. I, I think we do better when our lawmakers talk with each other, negotiate with each other, compromise with each other. Three quarters of Wisconsinites prefer compromise to sticking to your principles um, in order to get uh, something done. And so um, the people prefer compromise. Uh, they're not getting it from their lawmakers. And I would love it if our lawmakers would spend a little more time actually trying to engage with each other rather than either ignoring the other side or engaging in name calling for the purpose of scoring some cheap points. That sounds wonderful. We'll see what <laughs> happens, we'll see what happens uh, <laughs> next week when the extraordinary session called by the Democratic governor gavels in and gavels out. We'll see how many seconds that uh, lasts. It'd so be about Jim, the length of a bull ride, I think. <laughs> probably that. Uh, so Jim, first of all, I want to congratulate you and Susan on such a wonderful film. It brought back some vivid memories from my time covering the Capitol and reporting on a variety of issues in Wisconsin over the past decade. Can you tell us what was the inspiration for the film? Uh, sure. So we're in Wisconsin in the summer of 2018, and we knew we were going to make a film, but we did not know what that film was going to be. The midterm elections were happening, um, so we were interested in that. We were inspired by your Undemocratic series uh, and had thought about making a series of shorts or a short film that was based on those. Um, and we were sort of doing research, research and shooting and research and shooting and had a slow accumulation of sort of a direction. And I think once we met uh, Sheila Plotkin, uh, who we were introduced to by you, um, she really sort of sent us in a direction where we wanted to make a film about all of these issues, but make a more personal film and, and a feature film instead of a short film. So that was kind of a turning point. Um, and we just wanted to include as many interesting Wisconsinites as possible and find a way to, you know, look at these issues um, and see how they're affecting people's lives. Um, and we knew Jennifer Estrada from our previous film. We didn't know her well, but once we found out she was running uh, and we met her and her amazing community and family, that sort of really focused us um, in a way that, you know, a way that we could look at the election. Yeah. Um, now, Susan, obviously this film is told from a progressive democratic perspective. You followed some uh, people running for legislature. They're all uh, Democrats, uh, although there were, some, there were some Republicans in there, I'm gonna say, but tell us about the choice to use that frame for the story. And were there any aspects that you wish you could have added to the documentary? I think you're still muted. <laughs> Thank you, classic. Classic Zoom error. Multiple um, times a day. <laughs> um, you know, I don't think we didn't really think that we were making um, a film about Democrats um, at the time, and we didn't even we weren't even necessarily focusing on just the election, but more some of the issues that were coming up in it. So that sort of just happened um, because of the people we followed, but also we were really focused on how Wisconsinites were being disenfranchised and the people who were drawn to and who were most, most affected um, by a lot of these policies were Democrats. So that just kind of was a natural progression. Um, we, did, we did talk a lot about including more Republican voices um, and um, I could get into all of the, the mechanics around that because it's kind of interesting trying to bring, you know, to film people during an election is touchy 
Um, if if you're an independent filmmaker, people are worried that you know that you're trying to just get a gotcha for an ad or something. So you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes along with that. Um, but we ultimately just felt that, um, you know, I think Mike was pointing out, you know, that people aren't talking to each other. Jenny and Rebecca had Rebecca never got a debate. Um, Jenny only got a debate after putting up billboards and, you know, lots and, and newspaper things. And it was really hard won. Um, and we sort of felt, you know, the people that we were following and talking to didn't feel like their representatives were a part of their community. They didn't feel like they had much presence. So that at some point decided it for us that we didn't really feel that we needed to, you know, force them into this when they weren't really present. Yeah. But I would say one thing that you mentioned, one thing that we didn't include in the film that we wish that we had was um, Jesse Opoyen. Um, we had spent a lot of time with a journalist from the Cap Times. Um, and, and, and we also had a lot of other storylines for Foxconn and sulfide mining. But um, Jesse was really great. She was, she's a great journalist and she was writing about the governor's race and we were interviewing her through that process and following her around. And um, she's just, you know, really sharp and, um, and interesting. But then ultimately we had to take a lot of stuff out of the film. So that didn't become part of the storyline, but um, that was, you know, a loss that was painful to like. Yes, he uh, reports for the Cap Times in Madison and she has just been happily sent back to the Capitol to cover things because we expect things will heat up over the next year with the next uh, next uh, yeah. gubernatorial election. Um, I, saw, I saw that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm going to turn it back over to Jay to see if there were any questions in the chat. And if not, we have a series of questions that we would like to ask and Jay will handle it from here. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you for this great conversation so far. I'm not seeing any um, questions in the chat yet. So if you have any questions, feel free to write it in the chat and I will uh, ask it of our panelists here. But um, Jim and Susan, kind of pulling back the curtain a little bit, um, do you have any stories that kind of took you back while filming um, and post-production now that uh, people are seeing the film? Um, are there any memorable moments that you've gotten in reaction to the documentary? Um, <clears throat> memorable moments in reaction to the documentary or memorable moments while we were filming? Well, both. Uh, I would say while filming, um, knocking on doors with Molly McGrath uh, actually was quite a shocking day. I mean, we only filmed with her for a couple of hours and our film is not really a gotcha, huge moment kind of film. It's an accumulation of information and different scenes. Uh, but when I was with her, I was very shocked about you know, we're in a low income neighborhood in Milwaukee and she's just knocking on doors, talking to people about, you know, do you have an ID? Do you know where to vote? Do you know how to, you know, and how many people were either misinformed or didn't have an ID or, you know, there was just reason after reason. Uh, and there could have been so many more people in that scene um, where, where you see how voter ID laws affect people in a in just the simplest, you know, way. So that that was you know that was one afternoon. I can I can respond to the reactions. Um, just because uh, there's a couple of things that were have been sort of interesting. I mean, one is um, people outside of Wisconsin are fascinated by Wisconsin politics, um, and um, as we've shown it to people who aren't, you know, he, aren't in Wisconsin and paying that much attention, just the sense of alarm that um, people had as a reaction and um, concern about checking into their own state politics um, has been kind of, um, mark, you know, remarkable. Just how consistent that's been. Um, but also one thing that we didn't really think of it as a film about gerrymandering. I mean, that was a piece of the story and the accumulation that Jim was talking about. But um, as we've been showing it, 
um, a lot of people and we're showing it with a lot of, we're doing screenings with the League of Women Voter groups and things. And we're kind of amazed at how many people are saying that they didn't understand gerrymandering before and that they've finally got it, which is very satisfying because it was hard to figure out how deep to go. You can go really deep on that. Um, and so just surprising how much confusion there still is about it. Um, yeah, I think I think the film does a really great job of, um, you know, looking at the stories and the people behind these bigger issues. Um, Mike, do you want to talk a little bit about the the data behind these bigger, bigger issues? Sure. I, I just when, when Jim was talking about all of the people uh, that the filmmakers met um, who didn't have the right ID, we asked people in 2018, um, we did a pre and post election study where we interviewed the same people both in October and then again after the election. And uh, the number one reason people gave us for not voting uh, was not having the appropriate ID or being told when they showed up that they didn't have the appropriate ID and, and, were, and were turned away. And so, you know, it's, it happens disproportionately to uh, Black Wisconsinites and older Wisconsinites. Um, and it also happens disproportionately, uh, it seems, to those who have to travel, to take longer to find their way to the polls, probably because they either can't afford a car or uh, they're mm -hmm. just, uh, the, or where, where they vote is a little bit further away uh, from where they live. But we, we found that, um, the evidence in the film, we, we found that in our own surveys as well. Uh, and we have a question from Meg. It uh, has a little bit of a backstory, so I will read that and then we can get to the, the question at hand here. Um, but Meg says, I ended up being engaged in conversation with the consultant that guided the last gerrymander. He considered his work ironclad, <clears throat> excuse, excuse me, and said, there's really nothing anyone could do about it. With this particular legislature refusing to alter gerrymandering, what avenues can people even take at this point to stop the same thing from happening again? We know that the governor can veto it, but the Supreme Court here isn't necessarily free of political influence. So uh, yeah, I guess all of that to say, what, what can any of us do about it? I can answer part of it because that was, um, that's something that we have covered is uh, most recently the uh, U.S. Supreme Court decided that even if it's an egregious political gerrymander, that that they have no role to play in that. Um, if it's if it disenfranchises people of color or protected groups, then yes, the Supreme Court can weigh in. That's the U.S. Supreme Court. On the on the Wisconsin level, um, previously a lot of these cases went to the federal court system. Um, the Wisconsin, there were some conservative group and groups that asked the Wisconsin Supreme Court to be the first line in these cases. And, and they um, have declined so far because they're not a, what's called a fact-finding court. They're ones who like after another court makes a ruling, then they look at that ruling and see, is that supported by case law, by law and by decisions of the court, previous decisions. They usually aren't the ones taking testimony from the guy who did the you know, computer program that decided that Sheboygan should be split in half. Uh, so, so anyway, that, so right now it's unclear where it would go. It looks like it would probably go back to the federal court. But in terms of individuals, I will say Wisconsin does not have um, initiative or referendum that are binding on, uh, on the legislature. Uh, so we can pass a referendum saying we favor uh, medical marijuana, for example, or legalizing marijuana, but it has absolutely, no, it does not bind the uh, elected officials to doing anything. Thank you. Um, we have a, another question from a member of the audience uh, from Andy. Uh, Jim and Susan, could you play, please share some insights into the behind the scenes work involved in making a documentary? Um, I can imagine it involves some long hours and intense work under unpredictable circumstances. And to expand upon that, could you please talk about why you pour so much of your own time and resources into filmmaking in Wisconsin? Susan? 
Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I can I can start this off. I mean, the the certainly the Wisconsin part is um, you know I'm I'm from Fond du Lac. I spend a lot of time there, and um, I, I really am proud of my public education and you know the the kind of civic engagement that I and everybody had growing up. Um, so when seeing that be eroded, I mean, I'm like one of millions. I mean, I'm sure that you hear this all the time, like so many people from Wisconsin had, you know, great educations and look at what's happening um, in politics in the state and feel just heartbroken um, about, you know, kind of the undermining of democracy. Um, so that's, you know, and, and Jim's been coming with me and, you know, in, in a really interesting way saying like, hey, we're hanging out in this place that you've talked about and it doesn't look at all like what you shared with me talking about it. So he's kind of pointing out the contradictions. Um, in terms of the filmmaking, I'm going to let Jim talk about that, but I'll just say we put a lot of miles on our car. <laughs> Wisconsin's a big state, so that was um, one That's of the big good. behind the scenes. Yeah. Jim was up and out the door and home at one in the morning filming a lot of the time. It was about 15,000 miles in three months, but yeah. So yeah, so Susan and I are married and uh, we got married in 2011, so is that right? Yeah. So yeah. for me, coming to Wisconsin um, uh, over the last decade, you know, it, you start to see that it's a little microcosm of the whole country and what's going on in politics. And, uh, and there's been so many great books that have been written that we've, you know, been interested in and was, uh, you know, in our, our first film our, that we collaborated with uh, Center On, um, was, uh, I mean, that was just, that was just an eye-opening experience to make a film about the dairy industry in Wisconsin. And, uh, you, you see the huge immigrant communities that you don't see, um, day to day. So that was kind of really got our interest, um, in looking at stories in Wisconsin. Um, <clears throat> as far as behind the scenes, long hours, yeah. Uh, it was a, it was a, it was two years of uh, interesting, interesting, engaging work, and it was mostly just Susan and I. I mean, we don't, we don't have a huge crew of people. Um, uh, a handful of other people came in towards the end. Amazing composer and mm -hmm. sound mixer and color correction, and but it was mostly Susan and I. So um, hopefully, in the next film, we have a few more people um, on board. <laughs> Um, staying a little bit on the topic of, um, you know, behind the scenes, making the film, I find it really interesting that you kind of went into it, not really knowing specifically what it's going to be about and, um, you know, what characters are going to be involved and what people are going to be involved in, until you talk to Sheila Plotkin, um, as you were talking about earlier. Um, were there any other moments or, or, or what in particular um, did you find that that was gonna become the essence of the film or was there any um, important scene that led to you saying, okay, this is the direction we're gonna take this? Sure, I mean, Molly was certainly one of those moments, uh, but the, one of the first weeks I filmed with uh, Jennifer Estrada was um, primary day and she is running uncontested, but she's going to vote and uh, she's not on the uh, rolls, so and she hadn't moved, uh, so she was purged. We were not able to include that scene in the final film just because uh, that part of the story is kind of linear. You know, it's one of the first things we start with is primary day. Um, and we couldn't start with Jenny uh, enraged that she was, it just wasn't, we couldn't, you know, it was too much information too soon. But right away we were like, why isn't she registered to vote? So she had to register that day uh, and had she not had the right ID, she wasn't on the voter roll, uh, and there was no reason for it. She was never able to find out why that happened. Uh, and of course, in the film, we show a scene where people are testifying that there was a few hundred thousand people taken off the voter roll. So uh, that was certainly a day where, um, you, you know, you start to see things firsthand and what people are dealing with, so. 
And it's a little bit like um, kind of uh, sculpture, I guess, as you're, you know, chipping things away because it was, you know, we just the many iterations of it, it, it really took us a long time to realize what the film was about, um, which now seems really obvious and the title feels really appropriate that people aren't being heard, but that took us a very long time. And we spent a lot of time in Foxconn, <laughs> you know, deep in, in a lot of different stories that, that really didn't tell the story. So it took a lot of kind of chopping away at stuff and, um, and you know, figuring stuff out. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question from Andy, the active audience member. Um, <laughs> uh, this question is for you, Mike. Uh, you mentioned the Center for Communication and Civic Renewal. Would you please talk more about the center and its expanding role in helping us understand the dynamics of our state? Sure, so we uh, do a lot of research uh, that's focused on Wisconsin and then that also uh, compares Wisconsin to other swing states like Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Minnesota, North Carolina. And, and so we do public opinion surveys of people in our state. We do panel surveys of people in our state. We've done uh, about 300 qualitative, so deep, long, lengthy interviews with people from all over the state. Um, we also scrape uh, conversations on Twitter from social media about Wisconsin politics um, and analyze those. We look at public facing Facebook pages, so not your own personal Facebook account, but say, you know, the, the Marathon County Democrats, you know, the, those sorts of public accounts um, we, uh, we also look at. Um, and then we also ex analyze uh, newspaper coverage, television news transcripts. Um, talk radio summaries, anything really that we can get our hands on that relates to uh, the state um, and to try to tell a, a comprehensive story about what people want, why they want it, uh, are they getting it from whom, if not, why not, um, and, and that sort of thing. And so, um, so we do a lot of research. Uh, we also I give about 40 public talks throughout the state uh, throughout the year, kind of sharing things that we know with the people of the state. Um, we uh, also uh, place a lot of kind of uh, pieces in, say, the Cap Times, the State Journal, Journal Sentinel, that kind of thing. But then we also sometimes will take our, uh, our knowledge about politics in the state and try to apply it to something else. So when the pandemic hit, uh, we partnered with um, the Center for Health Enhancement uh, Systems, uh, or CHESS, uh, in the engineering school to uh, create an app called COVID-19 Wisconsin Connect that provided uh, fact-based uh, evidence about uh, the coronavirus at a time when people hadn't really heard of it before. But we also did live fact-checking of you know, misinformation that was flowing through the Wisconsin Twitter sphere. We would provide fact-checks for that um, and, and port it into the app for people to use. And so we're trying to find other ways that we can take what we know about politics in the state and, and apply it in, in useful ways to other kinds of problems that, uh, that the state uh, is facing. That's great, thank you. Um, this next question from Emily, um, I kind of want to hear everyone's uh, uh, perspective on it, but what are some of the factors that you think contribute to Wisconsin's politics being a microcosm of national politics? And that fascination with Wisconsin politics um, from outside the state? I'd say it because it's not a foregone conclusion. Right, uh, the state swings back and forth. We elect Republicans and Democrats at the statewide level, really liberal ones and really conservative ones. Um, we have big cities and big farms and small farms and small towns and uh, amazing colleges and crumbling infrastructure and surging tech corridor. We have all these kind of interesting things. It's, it's happening everywhere. Um, and it's not like other states that have some of these things where the result of an election is a foregone conclusion. It really matters who runs, it matters who volunteers, and it matters who votes. I would say they were ahead of, Wisconsin was ahead of the curve on the um, voter ID laws and gerrymandering. I mean, the voter ID laws considered one of the strictest in the country. And uh, Sechin in the film said that uh, the Wisconsin map was considered to be one of the most gerrymandered uh, in the country ever. Uh, but there was no way to put that incredible information in the movie because it just <laughs> didn't say it right. Um, so those sorts of things. I mean, and the divisiveness in, uh, you know. 
Susan? Yeah, I would I would just agree with both of those things. And you know, would we we um, showed um, Los Lecheros at a lot of film festivals because this this film we haven't because of the pandemic. You know, it's all been virtual. But everywhere in the country we went, people were standing up and saying, I don't understand what's going on in Wisconsin. Can you try and explain it? Which of course was, you know, not easy. But um, I think the fact that it's a swing state and that it's as unpredictable as Mike pointed out is just baffling to people and fascinating. Yeah, and Jim's point, you know, about the redistricting is, you know, in, in the history of our Republic, so thinking of all of the states and all of the times all redistrictings have ever happened, our current maps are the eighth most gerrymandered in the history of the Republic. That's pretty, pretty wild. Right. And he, and I think Sachin said it was like the fourth, there's all these different factors when you try to, you know. There are different ways to measure it for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so if you measure it one way, it was the most, another way, the fourth, the eighth, it's it, it's in the top. <laughs> and it's out of hundreds because we have 50 states who do this every 10 years. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That's incredible. Um, um, this next question is from Norman. Um, does anyone kind of going back to, you know, what can be done about gerrymandering? We kind of talked about um our role as citizens and what we can do um norman wants to know um does anyone see any plausible scenario for a correction of wisconsin's current gerrymander pattern or will it take the u.s supreme court we'll have to wait for that change i don't particularly see any because the u.s supreme court has already said if it's gerrymandered for political advantage then good luck people in that state. But it's a self-perpetuating issue then. It, it, you know, that same group guarantees its election the next time around and the next time. And we were paired with Maryland, which had a severe democratic gerrymander. And they made the same decision in that case, which is basically if it's just your politicians making sure that they keep the majority in perpetuity or at least for the next 10 years there's nothing there's no real test or you know balance that we can create no rules so we're not going to do it yep, the court has said incumbent protection is a-okay and so uh, parties take that seriously <laughs> I would I would add, and I it's it's a lengthy description, but the um, there is uh, an effort in Wisconsin. There's this People's Maps Commission that is working to draw what um, through a bipartisan group to draw what would be fair maps with a lot of um, public input that can be presented in the event that you know, it goes to a court that there would be an alternative map to the one that is prepared by um, the Republican led legislature. That's, I think, a really creative approach. It's not um, a legally binding approach, but it's um, something that people are getting involved in. I think it'll give the issue more attention. And uh, since, you know, we, we found in our own work that, you know, majorities of Wisconsinites favor a nonpartisan redistricting process. The more pressure people choose to put on lawmakers, uh, the more likely changes to come. But, you know, while people favor nonpartisan redistricting, it doesn't tend to be the issue that gets them out of their seats to protest. It doesn't tend to be the one that they're casting their vote on, you know, that they, they're voting on other issues and other priorities over, over redistricting, even though redistricting has a huge consequence for what kind of representation we get. And a uh, real quick question from Chris. Um, gerrymandering in across the country, is it uh, obviously in Wisconsin 10, 11 years ago, it was um, you know, Republicans that, that led this charge. Um, Democrats have done it too. Is there, is there one that does it more than the other? Is it pretty equal? They both, both parties are really into power so they will do whatever they need to for that. One of the one of my uh, office roommates in graduate school uh, studies state level redistricting. His name is John Winburn, who's a professor at Ole Miss, and he finds that um, it's not red or blue; it's who's in charge. If it's a partisan group in charge, they help themselves. 
if it is a nonpartisan commission or if there's a long history of having to go to court and have the court take away what the partisan map drawers are trying to do, then we get more uh, equitable maps. And so it's, it, it, Republicans and Democrats, when they have majorities, try to make things better for their side and make things worse for the other side. And that happens in relatively equal measure. Um, it's, it's when the rules are set up to prevent a majority party from running roughshod that we get more equal uh, representation. And I will say in Wisconsin, we Democrats controlled the assembly, the Senate and the governor's office in 2009. And they had the golden opportunity to implement nonpartisan uh, redistricting. And of course they figured, well, we're not gonna let the Republicans in, get involved. We're gonna win all of this. And then of course uh, they lost it all. Um, and, and that was part of a national effort called Red Map, which was very successful in many states, including Wisconsin. And there's a wonderful book uh, about Red Map that is has a vulgar title. So if you are interested in that, you can just Google it. Um, I want to thank everyone who has asked all these questions. They are great. We have some a little bit more time. So if you have any questions, feel free to add them. Um, but yeah, all these questions so far have been wonderful. So thank you. Um, Noel asks, uh, since the courts won't get involved unless racial minorities are being suppressed, is there a way to frame the gerrymand gerrymandering in Wisconsin as a race issue? Well, that has actually happened in, in the last redistricting. And then there were some slight boundary changes in Milwaukee based on some disenfranchisement of Hispanic voters. Uh, I think that was the extent of it. it. It didn't really change like the ultimate equation of who's most likely to get elected in each district uh, or in all the districts, let's say. But there was, it was determined that there were, I think it was two districts in Milwaukee specifically that they disenfranchise people uh, who are Hispanic. And so the, there were some boundary, boundary changes, but I don't think that those were um, like consequential. I think it's, it's partly a function of uh, where black and brown and and uh, Native American Wisconsinites live, uh, and it, it's um, if if every, if everybody of of every racial and ethnic background were evenly dispersed throughout the state, it would be an easier argument to make. That's interesting, um, Mike. Kind of going back to something you said earlier, um, the apathy surrounding gerrymandering. Um, is that because of the complexity of it? I, I know you mentioned that people are becoming a little bit more educated on the topic, but it's obviously, you know, not, not something that we are all super knowledgeable in. Um, so it, is it the complexity and the lack of uh, understanding about how important it is? I, I don't know. I, you know, I'm not sure it's just an issue of complexity. I mean, I think like the film, for example, makes this, it's not hard to understand if you'll, you'll give somebody who knows what they're doing a few minutes to tell you about it, you know, and, and the, the film I think successfully does that. And so I don't know that it's necessarily that it's complex. It's that one, it's a process issue. And so that just tends to be less motivating um, to people than, you know, am I going to have access to a legal abortion or not? Am I going to pay more in taxes or not? It's just a more motivating issue, I think. And then I think the, you know, uh, um, uh, another reason that it, tends to be an apathy issue is that it's an issue where people can say both sides do it, right? And, and so it, it's, it's, as Dee pointed out, it's, it's not like when Democrats had a unified government, they made it harder to engage in partisan gerrymandering. They, they did no such thing, right? And so I, I think there's, you know, some skepticism, probably well-earned skepticism uh, in many voters' minds that, any, that anybody would, would change this. And, and you can imagine it's, it's, it's hard to ask the Republican majorities in the Assembly and Senate, take an arrow out of your quiver that guarantees your majority status for the next several years. Like that is just not something you know, politicians are uh, wired to do. And I will note that Michigan went a different direction. There was a great uh, story, series of stories about this young woman who was upset about, about gerrymandering and she created this momentum behind, I think it was a referendum or initiative. I'm not sure what they're called in Michigan. Jim on the call might be able to help us with that, but um, it forced the legislature to change the way that it, it does its redistricting 
Um, but Wisconsin, as I said earlier, doesn't have those citizen initiative type of mechanisms for for a, a bunch of people to get together and make the legislature do anything. The most we can do is ratify things that they either plan to pass or already have passed and just tell them that we want them to do something different or we like what they did. Um, it was mentioned earlier that, um, you know, one of the, the, the basis of this documentary and, and starting to film in the first place was uh, um, a class you actually uh, taught, Dee, that, that produced a series of stories a few years ago uh, around the premise of what is Can You Hear Us Now? Um, do you mind talking a little bit about your series that you made, um, you know, what it was called and what it covered? Well, it was called Undemocratic Secrecy and the Power of, of the People, um, or let's see, Secrecy and Power of the People. Anyway, it was very close to that. Um, it was a student, it, it was a student-led investigation. It started out in a, an investigative reporting class that I teach every spring at the UW-Madison, and we always focus on one particular overarching issue, and then each student or groups of two students will go out and investigate that issue and then come back with you know, their reporting. And, and if it's good enough, uh, with, a, with some work on, on our side uh, by Wisconsin Watch, we were able to publish it. So this particular series, uh, we did one whole piece on gerrymandering and uh, explaining it as best we could, which it is a little complicated. We try to always do that through real people to help people understand. Uh, in that case, we featured one person um, who was in a packed district. In other words, there's, you know, her vote was diluted in the sense that it was always going to be Democrats winning that, um, that, I mean, district no matter what. And then one who was in a so-called cracked district where there, there were some Democrats there, but there was no way in the world that a Democrat was ever going to get elected in that one. So, so those were two examples of the packing and the cracking, which are the two techniques that, that are used. Um, so we used, we did gerrymandering. We talked about the issue of voter ID, how it disenfranchises tens of thousands of people, not only uh, people of color, people who are poor, uh, people who are elderly, but also very significantly college students. Um, it was very directly aimed at trying to keep them from voting. Um, we did a whole story on how le uh, legislation was being fast-tracked through the legislature under Walker so quickly that people didn't even have time to read it. It'd be like, it would be, and I covered the legislature during some of that time. I mean, one moment we would hear, um, you know, they're going to do a right to work bill. And then two days later, it'd be passed. And the public hearing would be a marathon thing where you'd have 200 people yelling at the lawmakers, them nodding their heads and then voting to, to uh, adopt it in a very quickly, um, quick fashion. We did a story that was kind of centered around uh, Sheila Plotkin because she had taken it upon herself to do these uh, open records request to try to figure out where are these ideas coming from, these things that are jammed through the legislature, like getting rid of the Government Accountability Board. There's no groundswell of opposition to the Government Accountability Board. It was a national model of how you implement, you know, campaign or how you enforce whatever campaign finance and election law. Um, and, and that was just gone. Um, and, you know, she found oh, thousands of people were opposed to it one or two or maybe no people were in favor of it and yet it got passed. Um, and then we also did a story about campaign finance and how the legislature, because it writes the budget bill and it, it well, it, it, it reacts to the governor's budget bill, but writes, it, writes the budget um, and, recover, and uh, passes bills. Oftentimes they're literally, they can slip in one or two words that can mean millions of dollars to uh, important campaign donors. And uh, we followed some uh, reporting that had been done by the Center for Media and Democracy, which discovered that the, um, which discovered that the, um, this language that had been inserted by a particular um, special interest group had also donated heavily to the lawmakers who inserted that. So, um, and it just showed how these, he, these things that are happening behind the scenes with all of these, you know, secret forces, sometimes secret campaign contributions, often secret ones, uh, are, are having huge impacts on our state that we had no idea were happening. So we are at an hour here. So I wanted to give everyone here um, 
kind of a last chance to uh, bring up anything that maybe uh, you feel is important to to make sure everyone leaves with, or is there, do you have any final thoughts? I nominate Mike. I'll, I'll say uh, that one thing we keep learning over and over in our research is that the more diverse and the more local people's information diets, uh, the, the better decisions they tend to make, right? The, the more likely they are to support um, candidates who think the same way they do about issues, right? The more likely they are to uh, participate in politics. And so the more we can all do to support local news, investigative news, like uh, what, what Dee and Andy and, and their whole team do, the more we can uplift documentaries that shine a light on this stuff, the better, because um, you know, an informed citizen, you know, not everyone is going to take the time to do it, but there are plenty of people who will choose good information if it's available, but won't look for it otherwise. And, and it's, it's part of our project to find those people and, and give them good information. Yeah, I would, I would um, just add, I mean, it was really fun to hear Dee run through um, all of the stories in that Undemocratic series, because um, that's the kind of journalism that I just, it, it's just so exciting to read stories like that. And um, I mean, we definitely were inspired by that. And, you know, just the kinds of things that you're sharing is really exciting to us. So it's kind of a nice feeling to be able to share the film uh, with, with you guys, just because you're the, the source of it. And it's just as you were, as Jay at the beginning was running through all of the things that you have coming up. I'm eager to, to read those, so hurry up. <laughs> As a Watchdog Club member, you will get early notification <laughs> of all these lovely stories as they come out. Well, I think that was a perfect conclusion. Uh, thank you all. Um, if you are interested in um, supporting the film. If you liked what you saw, you can go to 12letterfilms.com to support uh, this important documentary. And if you would like to read more of our stories done by the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism, you can do so at wisconsinwatch.org. Or if you'd like to support us, you can also find a link there at wisconsinwatch.org. I want to thank all of you for uh, being great panelists tonight. And I want to thank everyone who uh, came to the conversation. Thanks. Have a good rest of your night. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you all. There was one final question here from Norm. Oh, maybe he jumped off already. Thank you, everybody. Great. Yeah, it looks like he jumped off. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. It was nice, nice, nice talking to you all. Have a good yeah, day. Nice yeah. talking with Thanks you, Michael. Thank you very much.